are spiritually and emotionally. Plus, uh, it helps us to see what God sees. Right? Amen. Now think, of, think about what's on the screen. The, the problems show where we are, not only spiritually, but emotionally. Um, when a problem comes, are you a basket case? Are you like a chicken without your head control with a good cow? Are you, do you go bananas? Do you go uh, crazy? Do you get all nervous? Um, if, if that's the case, then emotionally you're not stable if you need to get help. What about spiritually? Uh, what happens when you face problems? Do you all of a sudden start questioning God? Do you get mad at God? Do you get mad at the church? Do you get mad at the preacher when problems come? Or, or, or are you spiritually sound? I've discovered in my life, and I pray that you've discovered in your life, that when problems ring your doorbell, they're going to show you, they're going to allow you to see what God sees. Yes or no? I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things. And God loves us. Oh, He loves us. He loves us just as we are. Somebody say amen to that. But He loves us too much to leave us as we are. So problems have to come our way. And, and just like coal, who has to go through fire, your faith, which is more precious than gold, must go through fire. Because he wants praise and prayer to be unhindered. He doesn't want religiosity. He wants praise and prayer out of our relationship with him. And that's what blesses. So we get to see what God So as we move on, we look at number three. We now examine the past. We, we see that he goes and, and, and spends time looking at what has transpired. So if we're going to pray and praise God, worship Him for His worthy, then not only do we need to be aware problems exist, and not only do we need to understand that, that there's a purpose in all of this, but now we need to take a moment looking at the past. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever, yes or no? Yes. Is God the same yesterday, today, or forever, yes, yes. or no? Yes. So that is what we're going to do. His prayer contains basic elements. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the house of the Lord and he said, now his prayer is going to reveal some things. First of all, he acknowledges the God of heaven who rules over all kingdoms. Are you not God in heaven? And no one can stand against you. In other words, he was rehearsing a truth. Why should I go bananas? Why should I think that nobody cares about why should I think that I'm going to say, are you not God in heaven? Oh, Lord God, are you not God in heaven? And the response is, yes. It's a question with an answer understood. And do you not rule of all the kingdoms? And in your hand. How I many of you know that the Bible mentions the hand of God as a mighty hand, and mighty right arm of God many times? And in your hand, is there not, is there not power in mind so that no one can stand against you? How many of you believe that God is almighty? So he acknowledges God. Number two, he recognizes that the land was a divine gift. Now he's not about to throw in the towel and run out because he's saying, hey, you know what? This, this doesn't belong to those three kings. This belongs to God. Did you not, he says, did you not give it to the descendants of Abraham? This is a divine gift for your people. It's like the church, for example, White Avenue Baptist Church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ, yes or no? Amen. So you and I would pray and praise, and you and I would preach and teach because this church doesn't belong to another institution. This church, the church of Jesus Christ, needs to keep the lights on, the doors open, and we need to keep telling people in the community that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Somebody say amen. amen. So this is his. Number three, not only does he recognize that, but he is aware that we must turn to God any and every time he gets out of the kitchen. When it gets out of the kitchen, it's not time for you to leave. Should evil come upon us, we will stand and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Again, uh, I could, I could, I, I delivered some other phrases in between just for the sake of, of time, but you can read it between. He mentions, mentions names and nations and all of that. But again, the, the thrust of it is, you know, when, when we pray, you hear. It, it, it gets tough. We call upon you. It gets difficult. It gets dangerous. It, the predicament is serious. We call upon you. He's aware that God, that we must turn to God. Don't ever stop turning to God. This is communication. This is communion. This is relationship. And number four is a big one. He brings forth an indictment of the enemy for their ingratitude. 
Uh, have you ever done something for somebody and let those people turn around and stab you in the back? Does that ever happen to you? Maybe you loan somebody some money, or maybe you allow them to stay with you, or maybe you uh, you just co-sign for them, or, or you I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do that people pay back in, in a not so good way. Well, when the children of Israel left, left uh, the Egypt and, to, uh, and the Exodus, as they were going to the promised land, God didn't allow them to eliminate these three nations. Israel had refrained from attacking them as, as, as a time at the time of the Exodus. But notice this. See how, and I'm saying to God, see how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession which you have given to us as inheritance. And nobody's saying to God, God, look how they're paying us back. And that's what a lot of people end up doing. So, so that's why you have to keep on, keeping on. As you look back, that, you know, it's happened. It happened to many of us. It probably happened again. Don't throw in the towel. Don't throw in the towel. Number four. Now I expose you powerlessness. Powerlessness. And uh, when it comes to spiritual matters, you do not tackle spiritual matters with the human strength. That's why when Paul says, we battle not against flesh and blood. Look, if you will, at verse number 12. This is uh, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. O our God, will you not judge them? Will you not judge them? Notice his admission here. For we are powerless. We are powerless. We are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know, no, notice the next admission, nor do we know what to do. Have you ever, have you ever been there? He said, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to meet my obligations. I don't know what I'm going to do with this disease. I don't know what I'm going to do with this man or this woman or my kids or my parents. Have you ever been there? Nor do we know what to do. But our eyes, notice, our eyes are on you. Amen? Notice. So he's, he's making an admission. We cannot handle them. And folks, the bigger the group, the more likely the problems, yes or no? Is it, if you have uh, no children, of course, you don't have any children problems. If you have one child, of course, you, you know, possibility. If you have four or five child, if you have a dozen kids, uh, and if you have grandkids and great grandkids, Things get complicated when you think of a church, you know, and we have to, there's no way that, that we can straighten each other out. We have to, our eyes have to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to turn to Him. So we are part of For me to be free to worship and praise God like I need to, I need to understand this is a spiritual matter, a spiritual matter. Number five, embrace the promise. Embrace the promise. This is where you become proactive. Instead of being passive, instead of woe with me, Instead of thinking of how bad things are, you become proactive. Embrace the promise. And I, I want to praise Him. I want to worship Him. I want to spread the gospel. I want our church to grow. I want my family to come to Jesus. You're going to be proactive. So God answers His prayer. God answers His prayer. And I want you to see His prayer in the book in verse 13. The Spirit of the Lord came upon the Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. This is the priest, the prophet, excuse me. And He said to them, Listen. Listen, he, he's calling them to listen. And, and I will say to us, listen, does say the Lord to you? Uh, it's interesting. God speaks to us collectively, yes or no. But God also speaks to us individually. God, the Spirit of God says to you, do not fear or be dismayed. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. In other words, they're big, they're, it's numerous. But listen, don't forget, don't lose perspective. Because of the great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but whose? Whose is the battle? God's. You see, I am free to pray, to praise, to worship, to preach, to share the gospel. But I understand that the battle belongs to the Lord tomorrow. Now my part, tomorrow go out to face him, for the Lord is with you. Now when he says, uh, tomorrow go out to face him, it means that you're, you're called upon to do your part. You don't go into your house and pull, out, pull down the shades, lock the doors, and say, okay, God, I'm not going to go out until all the problems are solved. No, no, no. You still live life. Because the last time I read the Bible, it says that we are the light of the world. Yes, we are. Amen. We're the light of the, and we're the salt of the earth. And if we're going to be light to the world, we have to be out there. If we're going to be salt to the earth, we have to be in there with the people. So go out tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Amen. Amen. The Lord is with you. Now, John, chapter 15, verse 5. 
Jesus said, without me you can do Without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. No thing. That's spiritual speaking. Paul learned that principle. Later on in Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who speaks. Yes or no? Yes. You see the difference? I can do, without me you can do nothing. But now in Christ, I can do all things through, through Christ who speaks. So that's why the relationship is vital, is important, and we must connect. So we embrace the promise. We embrace the promise and we move on. So again, as you think about it, we, we just press on. Now in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, I want to read this scripture because it's beautiful. Because he, he himself has said, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my help. I will not fear what man can do. Now, now I want you to think about this for just a minute. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Say with me. He said. He said. Now because he said, we say. Because he said, we say. What did he say? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Did you did you hear that? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You heard that right? Okay, if he said that this is maximum authority. If he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now you're liberated. The shackles fall off. And you can say, you can say, I will not fear what man can do. But then we will say boldly because his now is not us, but him in us. We can say boldly, the Lord is my help. Somebody say, the Lord is my help. The Lord is my help. The Lord is your help. My help is always with us. So number six, express your prayer. Now the shackles are off, and now we're poised, and all the noise, and you know, you need to kind of, kind of, you know, you kind of need to have a sense of humor, kind of be between the lines, kind of look behind the scene, and kind of see all the, all the junk that's going around us, like a bunch of chihuahua just nipping at your, at your back, like that. Uh, bunch of noise, bunch of noise. Express your praise. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. What did he do? He, he humbled himself. He bowed his face to the ground. And then they all fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. But notice what happens. The Levites, the Levites, when they bow down, they stand up. When people are worshiping, others are free. To praise and worship the Lord. They stood up about they stood up. What did they stand up for? To praise the Lord, the God of Israel. And they did it with a very loud voice. <laughs> they said, He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. If you were to put a fast forward, if you were to push the button fast forward, they go all the way to the book of the Apocalypse. The book of the Revelation, chapter 4. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. And that's what you're for you and I are going to do. The moment we see Jesus on the throne, Revelation chapter 4, you know what you and I are going to do? We're going to do the very same thing that 24 elders did. 24 elders, they fell down before him who's on the throne and they worshiped him. The 24 elders represent the Old Testament and the New Testament. The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, which is the, the, the church age. They bowed down before you and I will be bowed down. And they took out their crowns and they placed them at his feet. And I pray that you and I will have much to offer him when we go before him. They bowed down. So they praised. Now, two awe-inspiring facts about worship. Worship is a call to trust God. Worship is a call to trust God. You cannot worship with a genuine spirit if you don't trust Him. You cannot. You can sing without worship. You can preach without worship. You can witness without worship. But, but when you, if you're really going to connect with heaven, you've got to trust God. They rose early in the morning. Jehoshaphat said, listen to me. Put your trust in the Lord, your God. And you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and success.
see that this honors God. This honors my daddy, my father, when we trust him. Uh, if we believe that he is God Almighty, we'll be free to worship. If I don't believe that he is God Almighty, I'm going to try to take matters in my own hands. He is the God omniscient. And that means that he is a God who knows everything. Yes or no? Amen. He is a God who knows everything. Somebody say everything. 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 He knows everything. He knows my coming and my going. He knows. He knows my rising and my, my going. But he knows everything. If I believe that, I'll be free to worship. I won't be nervous. I won't be a basket case. I'll be trusting God more because he knows everything. That means that doesn't mean I'm passive. It just means that I'm at peace because he knows all things. And he is ever present. Always oh, with me. He never turns into, he's never too busy. He's never texting. He's never so busy. Oh, oh, uh, he's always communicating with us. Always. Always with us. So worship is a call to trust him. Um, let's get near and near to the truth. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? Does your wife trust Him more than you? Does your husband trust Him more than you? Think about it. Would it be really possible to trust God? Instead of trying to do things on your own. Trust Him. Trust the Lord, you say. Trust the Lord your God. You will be established. You will be established. In other words, you'll be, you'll, there will be a solidarity in your life. Number two, 